our Father in heaven, we do worship you and praise your name forever. Indeed, we are living in a great, grand, and awful time, the time of the end. We thank you, Lord, again for giving us this opportunity to learn more. We pray that you'll help us not only to hear, to read, but by your grace to do, to prepare our hearts and lives and those that are near and dear to us for the families that we represent. Pray, Father, that you will continue to be with Brother Jeff as he continue to present this message. Bless each one here and the families represented. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 41 of Daniel 11. <coughs> Soviet Union's been conquered in 1989 by the King of the North, the papacy, through an alliance with the United States. It needs to be noted prophetically here that the, the conditions, circumstances that are necessary to take place for a Sunday law in the United States are symbolized with the formation of the, are symbolized by what is termed the formation of the image of the beast. The image of the beast is something that is a, a progressive coming together of church and state in the United States. And if you want to find a place where you can prophetically say, um, even though there's things that went on before the Ronald Reagan years, if you want to be able to say specifically, here's a point that we can use prophetically as a starting point for the formation of the image of the beast, Verse 40 of Daniel 11 is that place. Verse 40 of Daniel 11 has many um, prophetic connections. And the formation of the image of the beast definitely started with the secret of alliance, even though there was things that went on before that contributed to it. Uh, it's underway, and it adds to the understanding of verse 41, because verse 41 is the Sunday law in the United States. Should we read the verse? He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. The, the argument against the la what we're presenting on these last six verses of Daniel 11, there's many minor arguments, but the battle is over the glorious land. What is the glorious land? And uh, so some of the things that I've prepared to say about verse 41 and the last six verses of Daniel 11 are um, from my overall um, interaction for months and years on the arguments connected with verse 41. And there is a way to approach the glorious land that isn't usually used that I want to put on the record here. Review and Herald. September 7, 1886. Commandment-keeping Adventists are occupying a peculiar exalted position. John viewed them in a holy vision and described them. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Lord made a special covenant with his ancient Israel if they would prove faithful. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And he thus addresses his commandment, keeping people in these last days. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. As I was putting this together, and I forgot to do it at several points, I told myself when I get to certain points here, I would advertise some studies that we do, not, for, not to sell anything, but just to point you in the direction of where there might be more information on some of these subjects that we're just going to lightly touch. But we have a study called God's Denominated People, and it's, it's part of the Prophetic Time series. And I would point you in that direction. There's some, what I think is interesting inf information, information about what Seventh-day Adventists are. We are God's denominated people since October 22nd, 1844. We are God's covenant people since October 8, 22nd, 1844. We entered into the marriage at that time. We received God's name 
at that time. We received the law at that time. Uh, modern Israel ha has received all the conditions of ancient Israel's covenant promises here at the end of the world. And this is an important point to make in the study of verse 41, I believe. Testimonies, volume 9, page 17, Exodus 31, 12 through 17, quoted. Do not these points point, out, point us out as God's denominated people, and do not they declare to us that so long as time shall last, we are to cherish the sacred denominational distinction placed upon us. The children of Israel were to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. The Sabbath has lost none of its meaning. They were to observe the Sabbath as the sign of their covenant with the Lord, and it has lost none of its meaning. If we're keeping the covenant, if we're keeping the Sabbath, then we're keeping the covenant. If we're keeping the Sabbath, we are His covenant people. The Sabbath has lost none of its meaning. It is still the sign between God and His people, and it will be so forever. And then I referred to this somewhere in the school, this particular quote, the reasons why we are denominated people of God are to be repeated and repeated. And generally we haven't heard even one reason, let alone have it repeated and repeated. We're his covenant keeping people. That which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through his church on earth today. He has let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, even to his covenant, keeping people who faithfully render him the fruits in their seasons. Never has the Lord been without true representatives on this earth who have made his interests their own. These witnesses for God are numbered among the spiritual Israel, and to them will be fulfilled all the covenant promises made by Jehovah to his ancient people. To them will be fulfilled all the covenant promises promises made by Jehovah to his ancient people, all the covenant promises. First Peter 2, 9 and 10, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. To us it is written, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is speaking about us. You know when, when this became present truth, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10? October 22nd, 1844. Because before that time we were not a people. But on October 22nd, 1844, the Lord established modern Israel, and the people that previous that time had not been a people, now they were a people. This is present truth for Seventh-day Adventists and has been since 1844. All who through Christ should become the children of faith were to be counted as Abraham's seed. They were inheritors of the covenant promises. We are inheritors of the covenant promises. Like Abraham, they were called to guard and to make known to the world the law of God and the gospel of his son. What are the three covenant promises? And maybe you didn't know there were three, but there are three covenant promises. And brothers and sisters, I hope you, you caught it, that you and I are the inheritors of those promises. So what are the three promises in the covenant? Um, and a resource, if you want to begin looking at the promises of the covenant, are the writings of Jones and Wagner. They dealt with the promises of the covenant. The first promise, promise of the covenant is that you and I can be created anew and receive the mind of Christ right here and now at the foot of the cross if we'll meet the conditions of salvation. That's a covenant promise, that he will put his mind and his heart in us if we will meet the conditions of the gospel. O wretched man that I am, Romans 7, 24, 25, and 8, 1. O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Do you remember where we were starting on the study of uh, the great controversy and Michael and we, we touched on what the battle in heaven uh, really was like because 
it was brought down here to earth and Sister White focused in what the battle was about. It was mind against mind. It was the battle in that area of our existence. But, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's one of the covenant promises is that you and I can have the mind of Christ right now, here and now. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. How many in this room believe that one of the covenant promises for you and I today as God's covenant people is that right now we can have the mind of Christ? Everyone believe that. If you believe it, raise your hand. Okay, anyone not believe it? Okay, that's one of the covenant promises, and we all believe it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Signs of the time, September 3rd, 1902. God permits every human being to exercise his individuality. He desires no one to submerge his mind in the mind of a fellow mortal. Those who desire to be transformed in the mind and character are not to look to men, but to the divine example. God gives the invitation, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. By conversion and transformation, men are to receive the mind of Christ. Everyone is to stand before God with an individual faith, an individual experience, knowing for himself that Christ is formed within the hope of glory. For us to imitate the example of any man, even one whom we might regard as nearly perfect in character, would be to put our trust in a defective human being, one who is unable to impart a jot or tittle of perfection. Covenant promise number two. Philippians 3.21 Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Brothers and sisters, we're going to receive a new body. Can we receive that new body here and now? No. Covenant num promise number two is a little bit different than covenant promise number one, but it is number two of the covenant promises that we can have a new body when Jesus returns to take us with him. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You know, it's totally outside this study, but I love this story. There, we, we met a friend uh, years ago. He lived in Bakersfield, California. The people uh, in Bakersfield all knew him because um, he was a helicopter pilot. And uh, right when they first started doing um, television news where they had helicopters, way back when, when they first started doing that, he, he was the helicopter pilot, pilot for the uh, local TV news in Bakersfield. So, and he was a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, so everyone knew him. He wasn't the TV announcer, he was the pilot, okay? Um, everybody in Bakersfield knew him, and, and we met him over a period of time, and there came a time, I don't know how many years ago, where there was a big earthquake in Los Angeles, California. And it, it broke some gas lines, it broke a bunch of stuff. The Northridge quake. The Northridge quake. And he was hired. How many of you, uh, I don't admit this, but probably uh, the most famous baseball announcer in the United States is a man named Vin Scully. Uh, don't admit that you know that. But uh, uh, Vin Scully worked for California State or something, and when that earthquake hit, he was given the job. Vin Scully's son uh, worked for California State, and when the earthquake hit, he was given the job to go out, inspect the gas lines that had been broken from that earthquake, and they hired um, this brother from Bakersfield to fly him with a helicopter. And both of them were in the helicopter together, flying low, and they hit a power line and burst into flames and went down on the ground. And they were just burnt beyond recognition. And a friend of ours, Seventh-day Adventist, went out to the crash site. And he, this brother always took his Bible. And he seen his Bible just, was just ashes. And he picked up his Bible, and it just turned into ashes. And there was only one 
portion of the Bible that left that came out of the ashes, and it said this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on corruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that little piece of paper was quite a comfort for his family. But that's the second covenant promise that we will have a new body. That's 1 Corinthians 15. It's up here on the screen, but when you ask the question, I'm wondering <laughs> if I've got some more typos in here. 15, 51 through 57. Covenant promise number three. And this is the focus that we're coming into on uh, Daniel 11.41. And brothers and sisters, in the Bible, the covenant promise of the three covenant promises that is by far spoken of more often than the other two is this particular covenant promise. This covenant promise pervades the whole Old Testament. You, you can't do a presentation on this and include everywhere and read everywhere that this covenant promise is addressed in the Old Testament, not in 55 minutes. No way. But let's look at what this third covenant promise is. Exodus 3, 14 through 17. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, thou shalt, not, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, unto the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. God's covenant people were promised a land to dwell in. We are God's covenant people. We are inheritors of all the promises of the covenant. Deuteronomy 6.3 And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. One of the characteristics of this land of promise is it's a good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with them. Fear them not. Numbers 14, 7 through 9. Deuteronomy 6, 3 says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers have promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. When the Lord promises something, is it iffy? If he promises it, it comes to pass, and he promises to give a land to his covenant people. Leviticus 20, 22 through 24. In this, I'm hopefully I'm going to emphasize as we go through the word inherit. Um, get, a, get a dictionary sometime. You don't have to. We'll have inherit here in a moment. But look at it in, in its, by its definition. Leviticus 20, 22 through 24. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land whither I bring you to dwell spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which has separated you from other people. Deuteronomy 8, 6 through 10. 
Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills. And for me here, he's defining what he means by a good land. Of, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. The good land, the promised land, the land that floweth with milk and honey, that the covenant people were to inherit, the good land is defined as a land that is abundant in its natural resources. It's abundant uh, with natural resources that allows the people to have an economic affluency where they can eat and be full. And there are some countries in the world that can eat and be full, and there's some countries that have famines on a regular basis. But what is the most well-known country in the world for people eating and being full? I've worked with, I worked with Dr. Arnott here six or, I don't know, a few weeks back, and he'll tell you what land it is. The land that has such an obesity problem that it's diabetes, is going to wipe us out if the Lord doesn't come back soon. It's the United States. Deuteronomy 11, 8 through 15. Therefore shall you keep all the commandments which I have commanded you this day, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land, whether you go to possess it, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed, a land that floweth with milk and honey. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither you go to possess it is a land of hills and of valleys, and drinketh water of the rain and of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord God are always upon it. Remember that. This is one of the characteristics of this good land. It's the land that the Lord watches over. That's that's. The covenant promised land, that's one of the characteristics. The land the Lord watches over. From the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Now notice, there, now if, you, if you're not familiar with the argument against the truth of the last six verses of Daniel 11, then you're not familiar that the argument is about the glorious land above all others. And you may think I'm being a little bit redundant on this subject of the covenant, but I have to be for the record. I want it on the record for this particular prophecy school, so please be patient because, I mean, I don't know how, you don't have to read very many of these before it clicks that the covenant people, one of the promises is that they were going to give a land, be given a land by the Lord to dwell in and it was going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. But the main argument here that's drawn against this truth is that the land of verse 41 is the people, God's people. And those people that teach that are not willing to make the right distinctions, and that's why they're going off into deep, deep darkness with that teaching. Notice this distinction, Deuteronomy 26, 15. Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven, and bless thy people Israel and the land which thou hast given us. Now, brothers and sisters, the Lord's making a distinction between the people and the land. They are not the same thing in the Bible. The land and thy people are two different entities. And bless thy people Israel in the land which thou hast given us, as thou swearest unto our fathers, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Jeremiah 32, 20 through 22, which has set signs and wonders in the lands of Egypt, even unto this day, and in Israel among other men, and has made thee a name as at this day, and has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders, 
and with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm and with great terror and has given them this land, has given the people a land. You can't, you, they're two different entities. And has given them this land which thou didst swear unto their father to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto thy seed. It's an inheritance. It's something that's passed down. An inheritance is passed down. Genesis 24, 7. Unto this seed will I give this land. Genesis 35, 9 through 12. And God appeared to Jacob again, and this is the passing down, when he came out of Padanaram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy lo loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. Brothers and sisters, you go back to Abraham in, the, in Genesis, and you start reading, and you watch every time that Abraham or his descendants have some biblical, historical event that's confirming and ratifying the covenant, and every time this land is mentioned in the covenant. It's part of the, it's one of the covenant promises. It's mentioned more than any other. This is part of the covenant. Now, there are some people that want to teach that uh, what makes the glorious land glorious is the church. And uh, there, is a, there is a certain aspect of that, but, but they go too far with it because they're trying to oppose the truth. Okay? L notice this. Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 6. Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness, the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness. The glorious land isn't glorious because of the righteousness of the Seventh-day Adventist Church any more than the, the promised land was a goodly land because of the righteousness of ancient Israel because ancient Israel was a stiff-necked people too, just like we are. The, the glorious, glorious part of the, the glorious land has to do that it's a, the promised land that God promises to give. It's glorious because it's one of the promises of the covenant, not because of the stiff-necked people that are the inheritors of it. But back to the verse. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it, for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Amen. Notice the distinction between the congregation, which is a term that's fair to call church, and land. Numbers 20, 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation, or how about this, ye shall not bring this church, into the land which I have given them. Those are two different entities. The church and the land, biblically, are two different things. The land is not the church. This is J.N. Andrews. After the Great Disappointment, J.N. Andrews wrote a classic. How many have read The Sanctuary in the 2300 Days by J.N. Andrews? It's classic. It's an important document, important document. In this document, he's explaining the, the misunderstanding of the Millerites, why they came to think that the sanctuary was the earth. And getting to his conclusion, he's going he's gonna to summarize the truth. And if you read this, and I've seen some hands here, you can ask the brethren in here that read it. This is a Bible study. It's text after text after text. It's 95% Bible and 5% J.N. Andrews. I mean, he's, he defends. He clarifies this from the Bible. He's not just speaking off the top of his head. And as he's getting to the conclusion, he says this, We have found that the earth is not the sanctuary, but simply the territory where it will finally be located. That the church is not the sanctuary, but simply the worshipers connected with the sanctuary. And that the land of Canaan is not the sanctuary, but that it is the place where the typical sanctuary was located. The church is not the sanctuary, 
the church is the worshipers. The land is not the sanctuary. The land is where the sanctuary is located. The earth is not the sanctuary. The earth is the territory where the sanctuary will be located. For whatever reason, one of the first important documents established by the pioneers clearly identifies that the church and the land are two different entities. Yet here we are at the end of the world and people are wanting to say that the glorious land is the Seventh-day Adventist church and some of them want to maintain the reputation at the same time that they are people that promote and uphold the pioneers of Adventism. Not all of them. Genesis 28, 1 through 4. Let's just take verse 4. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto you. Brothers and sisters, there's a difference between an inheritance and an inheritor. The inheritor is the one that receives the inheritance. And the land is the inheritance, and the people are the inheritor. And as this word inheritance is connected with the promised land in the Old Testament, it's not just spoken of one time, it's throughout it. Inherit, to come into possession or receive, especially as a right of divine portion. And everyone, and everyone who has left houses or brothers and sisters for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and eternal life, Matthew 19, 29. Second definition, to receive as a right or title, descendable by law from an ancestor at his death, to receive as a de device or legacy, to receive from ancestors by genetic transmission, to have in turn or receive as if from ancestor. An inheritor and an inheritance, two different things. They're related, they're related, but they're definitely two different things. Exodus 32, 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it. The land is the inheritance. The people are the inheritor. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall unto you for an inheritance, even the land of Canaan, with the coast thereof. These are they whom the Lord commanded to divide the inheritance unto the children of Israel in the land of Canaan. This is, this is something that can be divvied up and given to people. It's not the people. It's not the people. If the glorious land is the people and we're going to divide them up, <laughs> we're going to need a machete. <laughs> it's a different entity. An everlasting possession. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be the father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting come. Are we Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise? to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Possession, the act of having or taking into control, control or occupancy without regard to ownership, something owned, occupied, or controlled. The children of Israel were going to have a possession in the land of Cana. It wasn't, they're not interchangeable terms. Property, something owned or possessed, a piece of real estate. 
Psalm 135, 12. I gave their land for an heritage, an heritage unto Israel, his people. It's not only an inheritance, it's not only a possession, it's a heritage. What's a heritage? Property that descends to an heir. The heritage and the heir are two different things. One receives, the other is what is received. And I gave their land for a heritage, for his mercy endureth forever, even an heritage unto Israel, his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. All who through Christ should become children of faith were to be counted as Abraham's seed. They were inheritors of the covenant promises. Like Abraham, they were called to guard and to make known to the world the law of God and the gospel of his son, what are the three covenant promises? That we can have the mind of Christ right now at the foot of the cross if we meet the conditions of salvation. That if faithful, we will receive a new body and that we will have a land of promise as an inheritance, as modern Israel, his covenant people, his denominated people at the end of the world. So, let's look at verse 41. Verse 40 begins at the time of the end. When's the time of the end, class? 1798. Is that before the time period of the cross or after the time period of the cross? So we're looking for a spiritual application of verse 41 because it's just flowing along with verse 40 and onward, right? So we're dealing with the glorious land. And glorious means in sense of prominence, splendor, beautiful, goodly, the glorious land. Um, you can find many references of it in the Bible. The first place probably to look is when the prophet uses it himself, and the, if the prophet uses it itself. If you're looking for a symbol in Bible prophecy to come to understand it, the first place to look is to see if the prophet used that symbol previously, and Daniel did so in verse 16 of the same chapter. It says, Be, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. And Uriah Smith commenting on this verse says, after putting an end to the war, Pompey demolished the walls of Jerusalem, transferred several cities from the jurisdiction of Judea to that of Syria, and imposed tribute on the Jews. For the first time, Jerusalem was by conquest placed in the hands of Rome. That power was to hold the glorious land in its iron grip till it had utterly consumed it. And I know some people like to force that into saying that what Pompey conquered there was Jerusalem, but that's not what Uriah Smith is saying and that's not what history is saying. It's saying the whole land of Palestine was conquered. He also did some severe damage to the capital, Jerusalem, but the glorious land here in verse 16 is the land where the children of Israel were living and it was conquered by Rome. So, if that's the first place to look to get a definition of what the glorious land would symbolize, that glorious land was the land given to ancient Israel. What would the glorious land be in verse 41 after the time period of cross in the time period of modern Israel. It would be a land that was given to modern Israel that should meet the same identical criteria that we find in a good study of the glorious land in the Old Testament for ancient Israel. It should be a land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because ancient Israel had the responsibility to carry the gospel to the world. They, they failed, but they still were to do it. And the Lord put them in a land that provided the, the affluency to carry the gospel to the world should they do so. That was the purpose of the land. The land was not in the South Pole or the North Pole. Ancient Palestine was at the very center of the ancient world. This is where all the major nations passed through, making it very easy to carry the gospel to the world should ancient Israel have chosen to do so. In the time of Solomon, it was definitely the most prominent nation in the world, and glorious means in sense of prominence. 
So we should be looking for a land that meets that same criteria, but I'll throw one more in. I've already mentioned it in an earlier presentation. When you take the word glorious, meaning in sense of prominence, and you compare the United States fulfilling the role for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, modern Israel, fulfilling the role, the purpose, that was also fulfilled by Palestine in ancient Israel, you see that the United States, in terms of flowing with milk and honey, it's the most affluent country in the world. It qualifies there. It's at the center of the modern world, just like the center of the ancient world was Palestine. Those things, the, the glorious aspect is nailed down perfectly, but the glorious land of verse 41, it's in sense of prominence. There's another um, place where it is prominent, and you know where it's at? In Bible prophecy, the focus of end-time Bible prophecy is the United States of America. The struggle over religious liberty takes place here that leads up to the Sunday law that starts here. Brothers and sisters, in sense of prominence, the United States calling it glorious and being true to the definition fits 100%. But let's read this. This is from Hiram Edson, a pioneer. And uh, evidently, you look back at Hiram Edson and there's every reason to have confidence in Hiram Edson. Amen. But just as a kind of a a weak way to put confidence in him, but it's still a good one in my mind. This is a man that James and Ellen White named their son after. That lets you know the kind of confidence they probably had in him. I say probably. I don't really know why they named their son Edson after Hiram Edson, but to me, it's, it says something, okay? But you disregard that and go look back what the contributions that Hiram Edson made to the pioneer movement, and you'll see that this is a good man, and this, this article here, uh, this series of articles, it would be a blessing if you had time to read the whole thing. And he's, he's making a case that after the 1260 years of papal rule that the Lord had promised that he was going to provide a land of refuge to gather his people into, and this is just one little passage in it, and it's a, it's a Bible study, it's a Bible study. And I'm cutting into it to let you see that he's talking about the United States and then we're going to point out what he says about verse 41. In this, it is in this American land that the great body of the church has chiefly shared her glorious triumph and prosperity since 1798. We have reached the appointed time when the great body of God's living, professed people are to be found in such a land as above described, and there is no people or country on the habitable globe at this time that will answer the above description but the people and country of this American land. From the above, it is clear that the wilderness of preparation is the pleasant land brought to view in Daniel, brought to view Daniel 8, 9. It is called in chapters 11, verse 41, 45, the glorious land and the glorious holy mountain, or goodly land, land of delight or ornament. Now, brothers and sisters, Verse 45 and verse 41 are identifying two different things. Hiram Edson wasn't seeing that. But if you put J.N. Andrews' article with him, you'll see the pioneers were, were clarifying issues at that time. But nevertheless, even though he's wanting to apply verse 45, the glorious holy mountain to the United States, just read it again. Read it again. Right in here is what I want you to see. It is called... In chapters 11, 41, 45, the glorious land and the glorious holy mountain, or the goodly land, or land of, the land of delight, or ornament. He's making a case that the land, he's not focusing on the church. He's, he's, the argument here today is that the glorious holy mountain of verse 45 is the Seventh-day Adventist church, and it is. The glorious holy mountain of verse 45 is God's church at the end of the world. But the argument against the truth here is that because the glorious holy mountain in verse 45 is the church, therefore the glorious land of verse 41 is the church too. That's wrong. And higher medicine wasn't seeing verse 45 right, but what I'm wanting you to see is he's making a case for what America is in Bible prophecy. And here he's identifying that the glorious land in verse 41 is the United States of America, and he's correct. 
he's correct. And therefore, the pioneer position on what the glorious land in Daniel 11 verse 41 is, is that it's the United States of America. God does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men with tearful utterances, the husbandman says. What more could I do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? The unrivaled mercies and blessings have been showered upon our nation. It, it, it has been a land of liberty and the glory of the whole earth. Review and Herald, May 2nd, 1893. The Great Controversy, 252. Many were driven across the ocean to America and here laid the foundation of civil and religious liberty which have been the bulwark and glory of this country. Religious, religious and civil liberty, the glory of this country. Why? Because that was God's design because this is the issue at the end. God brought his chosen people out of the land of Egypt that he might bring them to a good land, a land which in his providence he has prepared for them as a refuge from their enemies. This is speaking about ancient Palestine. He would bring them to himself and encircle them in his everlasting arms and, return for, and in return for his goodness and mercy they were to exalt his name and make it glorious in the earth. It was a refuge. Maranatha 193, the Lord has done more for the United States than any other country which, upon which the sun shines. Here he provided an asylum. Asylum means refuge. It's fulfilling the identical purpose here. Here he provided an asylum for his people where they could worship him according to the dictates of conscience. Here Christianity has progressed in its period. The life-giving doctrine of one mediator between God and man has been freely taught. God designed that this country should ever remain free for all people to worship him in accordance with the dictates of conscience. He designed that its civil institutions and their expansive production should represent the freedom of the gospel privileges. Brothers and sisters, God designed the United States. He, he's putting it in a place of distinction among the other countries of the world. Signs of the Times, June 12th, 1893, when the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for his people that they might worship him according to the dictates of their own consciences, the land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread, the land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ, when that land shall through its legislators abjure the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy and tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. The glorious land of Bible prophecy, the one in prominence is the United States is be because this is where the Sunday law issue hits first. And it was God's design to be that way. Review and Herald, May 2nd, 1893. The people of the United States have been a favored people. Remember, um, the land of promise in the Old Testament was a land that God watched over from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. The people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countenance to popery, the measure of their guilt will be full and national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of this apostasy will be national room. As Russell said earlier this morning, he didn't say this, but he identified the principle that national apostasy is followed by national ruin. He pointed out that in Constantine's time period, in the year 321, Constantine passed the first Sunday law, and in the year 330, national ruin arrived. National apostasy is followed by national ruin. It's a principle that always applies. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 92. Is it in vain that the Declaration of Eternal Truth has been given to this nation to be carried to all the nations of the world. God has a chosen people and made them the repositories of truth weighty with eternal results. Who's God's chosen people today? And what, what are they called prophetically? There's so many, I'm looking for modern Israel. This is modern Israel, right? Modern, modern Israel has been given the responsibility to carry this message to the, to the world. They were the repositories of this truth. They're the covenant people. They're the covenant people. But notice here where she's connecting them. In this country, God established his covenant people. Now, was the Seventh-day Adventist church 
uh, born in uh, Bolivia? Zimbabwe? No, brothers and sisters, it wasn't an accident. It was God's design that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was raised up in this country. It is, is it in vain that the declaration of eternal truth has been given to this nation to be carried to all the nations of the world? God has chosen a people and made them the repositories of truth, weighty with eternal results. To them has been given the light that must illuminate the world. Has God made a mistake? Are we indeed his chosen instrumentalities? Are we the men and women who are to bear to the world the messages of Revelation 14, to proclaim the message of salvation to those who are standing on the brink of ruin? Do we act as if we were? America. First time I was in London. First time I was in London, somebody hit me up on this particular part of the study. I forget the words, it was something like, you know, you Americans, you're real arrogant. You come over here and you're, you're telling me the, the glorious land is the United States because you're from the United States. Do you remember who that guy was? You remember who he was. <laughs> no, no, brothers and sisters, there's no arrogance involved. America, where the greatest light from heaven has been shining upon the people, can become the place of greatest peril and darkness because the people do not continue to practice the truth and walk in the light. Our land is in jeopardy. The time is drawing on when its legislators shall so observe the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Romish apostasy. The people for whom God so marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will by a national act give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome and thus arouse the tyranny which only waits for a touch to start again in cruelty and despotism with rapid steps. We are already approaching this period. Brothers and sisters, I don't know when she wrote the spirit of prophecy passage right here. I don't think we're doing rapid steps anymore. I think we're running full speed ahead. So, Daniel 11, verse 41. The first obstacle for the papacy was overcome in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, a collapse that was brought about by an alliance, a secret alliance that was formed b between Ronald Reagan and the Pope of Rome, Pope John Paul II, thus marking prophetically that the image of the beast was beginning to be formed in the United States, marking prophetically that the United States has begun to fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy and giving the necessary logic to understand that in verse 41, what's being described <coughs> is the Sunday law in the United States. The movement for the Sunday law in the United States is began in verse 40. You can see the logic of that if you understand verse 40 correctly. And it says, He, the King of the North, the papacy, shall enter into the glorious land, the United States of America, and many countries shall be overthrown. And many countries will not be overthrown when the United States bows to Rome at the Sunday Law. Just many people will be overthrown. But these shall escape out of its hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. A key word in this verse is escape, and uh, we'll deal with that later. But basically, I want you to see in closing here that as the papacy conquers the United States in verse 41, what is portrayed for us is two groups. One group that is overthrown and one that escapes out of the hand of the papacy. Two groups. To identify who these, these two groups are is to begin to bring into focus uh, the, 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 the dynamics of this verse. Um, I can't start the next presentation, and I don't know how much more I want to say. I'll give you the overview, just for the record. Who is it that's overthrown at the Sunday Law? We went through it in the purification of God's church. There's many overthrown. The foolish virgins. The foolish virgins. I mean, pr primarily the, the Protestants of America that have already fully said in their mind, and God knows who they are, that Sunday is sacred, and they're not going to be shaken out of that belief. 
you know, that's the line in the sand for them as well. But prophetically, the people that are overthrown at the Sunday law are people that have light in relation to Sabbath and Sunday. The many that are overthrown, and it's worth being clear about this, the many that are overthrown here are, is not a few. It's many. Many are overthrown. And the people that are held accountable for the light on Sabbath and Sunday when the Sunday law arrives are Seventh-day Adventists. So what's it saying? It's saying that many Seventh-day Adventists are overthrown. Prophetically, at this time, the third angel's message once again becomes present truth. It's always been present truth since October 22, 1844, but at the Sunday law, it, it takes a step upward in the, the kind of present truth it is. And what happens at that point? What happens to the third angel's message at that point? The fourth angel's message joins it. The loud cry begins to swell. And Sister White speaks about the swelling being an increase of power. That's what the loud cry is, the swelling of the loud cry is symbolizing, is this, this final warning message escalates. But what I want us to focus on here briefly is that this is where the fourth angel's message comes in. And what's the fourth angel's message? Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. And there's at least five places, at least five different places, where Sister White says, that the two times that Christ cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry and at the end parallel the second and the fourth angel's message. She quotes them in, in those five places. Four of the times she quotes the second and fourth angel's message. All of the times she refers to them. And what am I saying? I'm saying that the second angel's message was symbolized by Christ cleansing the temple the first time and the fourth angel's message was representing the the second time Christ cleansed the temple was representing the fourth angel's message. And if the second angel's message reached its climax on October 22, 1844, what happened to the virgins in Adventism numerically? They went from 50,000 down to 50 overnight as Christ cleansed his temple. Now, it would be merciful if it's a thousand to one ratio this time, but brothers and sisters, when the fourth angel's message arrives, Christ is going to cleanse his modern temple for the second time, and many will be overthrown. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this promise that we are your covenant people. And we know that we can have the promise of your mind right here and now, and we ask that um, you continue to uh, keep that mind within us through the infilling of your Holy Spirit. And if there's any in this room that uh, don't possess that mind at this time, we ask that you would do whatever it takes, whatever work upon their heart, that they might seek that blessed promise of the covenant right here and now. And we thank you for the promise that if we're faithful, that at some point in time when you return, we will have a glorified body that can live for eternity. But we also acknowledge that you provided a place for your covenant people here at the end, for them to be established, to carry this final warning message to the world, and that this place is about to become um, a place of great darkness and persecution. And we have but little time to work, so we ask that you'd empower us and inform us that we can be faithful um, workers at this time in Earth's history. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.